session, as you all know, is Heroines of Composition and it brings together three notable female voices in instrumental music performance and composition, discussing the Van Diemen's Band Heroines Project. They will also be discussing the challenges that women still face in the music industry, the role and importance of mentorship, and recognising those unsung heroines of musical composition. Topics that probably all resonate with us as we're still celebrating, I know I am, International Women's Day, a few days late. I'm pleased to be able to introduce Julia Friedersdorf, Artistic Director of Tasmania's world-renowned Van Diemen's Band, award-winning composer and teacher, Maria Grenfell, and joining us via Zoom is the only Australian ever to win the APRA Art Music Luminary Award four times. Described as an invigorating musical life force, leader of the Offspring Ensemble and percussionist Claire Edwards. Please join me in welcoming Julia, Maria and Claire to the stage. Thank you, Amalia, and uh, welcome. Good morning to everyone here. It's very bright, um, but I'm, I'm sure there are some people here <laughs> clapping. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today in, in uh, one of these uh, Hedberg talks, which is a fantastic opportunity also to bring the Hedberg to the people of Hobart as, as it's part of the university and it's also in such a fantastic location. Um, I've been teaching at the university for almost 25 years and it's very exciting to have a, a new building that we've been breaking in over the last few years without, uh, with the exception of the, the COVID period. Uh, today, this, this the talk has been advertised as having some sort of subheadings and being a bit of an academic, I do enjoy a subheading. Um, so we have sort of decided we would talk a bit about amplification of women's voices, representation of women in general in, in the arts, in composition and performance, um, and also mentoring as all three of us have undertaken quite a bit of mentoring in different ways. And I thought we, it might be interesting to... Um, for you to find out just how mentoring works in different uh, types of uh, situations. Um, but Julie, I would like to talk to you first and, and ask you about um, the historical role of women in music and performance and composition, because it's something that comes up now and then and sort of then glossed over and move on really quickly. So would you like to talk to us about that? Sure, Maria. Uh, the historical role of women has changed over the decades and um, centuries. I would say there's been a sort of an ebb and flow of um, some some periods where we're really uh, providing some form of platform um, and others where really kind of uh, not giving women a voice at all and or um, containing that voice to particular roles. Um, but uh, our program heroines that we're performing tomorrow is uh, highlighting some composers from the 17th and 18th century. Um, the 17th century, uh, for example, in Italy, we're featuring uh, Barbara Strozzi and Francesca Caccini, who were both based in Florence. Um, they were both born of um, uh, fathers who were part of uh, a, the Incogniti, which were a highly intellectual group who were interested in poetry, all, all art forms basically, uh, as well as astronomy, um, closely linked with Galileo and the likes. And um, those people were... Uh, teaching their daughters the skills of music and and in the, both of those cases they showed prodigious talent and um, were then, you know, through their parentage and their connections were able to, to have reasonably good careers. They published works which was, you know, already something somewhat of, of an achievement even for any composer in those days. Um, so, um, that, that period, even though we don't know of those co composers as well now, um, in their day, they, they did certainly have a platform. Um, we're also featuring another composer who's not well known at all, Antonia Bembo. Um, she was uh, born in Venice and, um, as all women had to be in those days, they either had to be 
concubined or married. Um, she chose marriage and unfortunately she had an abusive husband and was filed for divorce, filed for divorce, but was not permitted to. Yeah. And then she, so she fled and she went to France and so she, she uh, then ended up in a convent and that was the way that she got her music out there mm. by um, har- being harboured in the convent and writing music that was mostly religious um, and a combination of both styles. So she was um, very inventive in her way of keeping her music going. Um, and we also feature Jacquet, Elizabeth Jacquet de Laguerre, who was um, a child prodigy harpsichordist, um, and she was uh, taken in by Louis XIV, as was Francesca Bem- um, Bembo, it has to be said. So, again, royalty choosing these women and saying, these women have talent, they need to be heard. So, so were they primarily performers? Is that how they were discovered? Yes, mostly performers, mm. singers, keyboarders. Um, most people uh, played several instruments in those days. Mm. So, um, uh, yeah, they were, the, the training was incredible, actually. Mm. The, the, this, this is something that I'd love to see these days. Um, your teacher would play with you every day. Right. <laughs> you would be taught every day. So your practice sessions were completely mentored wow (laughs) which would be extraordinary so it explains some of the skill levels that we saw back then but yeah so all of these women um I would say got uh their voices heard through um some privilege some amplification from people of power and also the smarts the political smarts so yeah yeah right and so if we move forward you know another couple of hundred years we we know about Clara Schumann and Fanny Mendelssohn and they came to composition through slightly different circumstances um can you talk a little bit about about their lives in some ways uh as composers they had it even more tough I would say because um at that time women weren't really considered to be able to have that talent they were of course uh, uh, musicians who were um, performers and respected performers. But um, as far as composition, I would say that they did have to defer to, in this particular case, their spouse mm. being the, the main breadwinner. Um, they had children to look after mm. in both of those cases. And um, and then there was some probably social prejudice as well involved. Mm. So um, in, in some ways they had an even tougher time um, to get their music out there, mm. Mm. I think I think that's that's been the general um, situation for for women composers until really quite recently. And uh, I'd like to jump to Claire, uh, who's the artistic director of uh, Ensemble Offspring, which is a very well re- respected and fantastically prolific uh, new music ensemble uh, based in Sydney. Uh, Claire, a couple of years ago, you and Ensemble Offspring, Offspring committed to at least 50% of women composers programmed in your concert. Can you talk, in your concert series, can you talk about uh, how that came about and what the reactions were from not just performers but also audiences? How did that come about? Well, it was um, 2017 was actually the year that we committed. We did a whole year of only female composers and it was at a time, I mean, it doesn't sound that long ago. It's about six or seven years ago now, but it was at a time when you have to imagine that this still wasn't part of the consciousness yet, you know, generally speaking. And so um, Damien Rickardson who was then the uh, co-artistic director with me and I, we had sort of been analysing our own programming a little bit, going, oh, this is very strange. You know, most of our works that we're performing are still by male composers because, of course, what you guys were just referring to about, you know, Fanny Mendelssohn and Clara Schumann, that's gone right up until now. So even in the 20th century, there are very few uh, female identifying composers. Mm. Who were, who were really famous or given a voice. So that was kind of knocking on into our programming. And we both sort of said to each other, this is ridiculous. You know, we're playing mostly living composers, a lot of Australian composers. We have to do better. So we, uh, it was very exciting for me, actually. That year was, I think, my first year as sole artistic director. And so discovering all these new voices and having the uh, the freedom and the ability to make all of our programs feature female composers was just so amazing. And we didn't really, um, 
we didn't sort of shout out to the rooftops about it in the press. We just did it and then saw what happened. And as it happened, we were one of the first kind of groups around the world to kind of start really being very conscious about this gender equity in classical music programming. And since then, um, I've become the ambassador of an organisation called Key Change, which is out of Europe, and they're the ones who sort of have this system whereby you pledge um, 50-50 programming um, or, or musicians on stage or board or staff or whatever, but it's about gender equity over the whole of classical music and also more broadly music programming. And I just think it's such a great initiative, I mean, especially for an ensemble like ours that is mostly working with living composers, we absolutely have no excuse. And it's been so brilliant to see uh, Australia kind of lead the way to a certain extent alongside the UK, Europe and America and really see how much change can happen in such a short period of time. We still have a long way to go, but it, it's, it's an exciting start to the process. Fantastic. Um, did you find that there were a lot more women composers than you realised that you could program? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and what happened through that process was that I had um, this massive list that I couldn't even get through uh, in that year. So mm -hmm. it made programming at least 50% female composers the easiest thing in the world and indeed more than 50% of our commissioning then became female composers, probably about 70%, I would say. Um, and, yeah, that was purely through being almost forced in the first instance to get to know who was out there. And I think too many people just go along with what they've always done, which is not researching new composers, not researching new music. And, um, and I would highly recommend this this process, this quota system to kind of force change in your institution or in the way you listen to music even. Hmm. And how did you find audiences reacted to this commitment? You know, audiences, they don't really care. I mean, they, they just want to listen to good music. They just want to be taken on a journey. Um, you know, with our music, it's often quite different and it's... Um, so often music that people have never heard before. And so they're not there kind of going, oh, who's this by and do I approve of this composer? Um, so actually I think it proved that, that good music wins out. And, you know, we hear so often this argument, oh, well, you know, why do female composers have to get a, a leg up at the moment? It just, if it's good music, it'll, it'll get out there. But the thing is, that's not how our system's been for the last however many hundreds of years. And so if we do need to make this conscious change to get the level of consciousness around female composers. And so I don't think, I think audiences, you know, loved it that we were sort of pushing boundaries, but I don't think anyone was kind of up in arms about the lack of male composers. <laughs> Mm. What about you, Maria? How have you found it as a female composer yourself? Uh, did you have the same opportunities um, when you were developing? Um, I think I was. Uh, I, I received a few commissions quite early on in my career when I was when I was just a, a postgraduate student um, for uh, women's music festivals or concerts specifically by women. But I have to say, it hasn't really been. Um, something that I've had to really be worried about. I um, I think that um, I think it's true that good music does um, is is the music that tends to get performed. Um, but I think it's also it's really, really important that female composers have the opportunities to have their music performed and that it's actually uh, recognized that uh, they are you know 50 percent of the population and um, women composers uh, shouldn't really be forgotten about and sometimes sometimes they are because or well, for various reasons to do with representation or familiarity or um, women who women composers a lot of them might not be quite so um, bold to push themselves forward and do a lot of self-marketing which is what you really need to do for you know to amplify your representation I guess in in the world of composition 
Um, I know that the ABC has been very um, conscious of uh, increasing quotas in women's music and it actually has worked despite scepticism from a lot of people. And I think it's a fantastic thing that's that's happened um, on, the, on the radio and uh, I look forward to hearing far more women composers in, on concert platforms because uh, that's sometimes where it might be a little bit uh, um, less than on broadcasting and broadcasting. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Can I just, sorry, Julia, can I just say one thing? Um, just on that note about women not pushing themselves quite as much. Um, I've no, I mean, when we talk about mentoring, maybe we can talk about this more, but I've noticed this very much with um, applications to our Hatched Academy, but also mm. just the, the ratio of people who reach out to me to ask, you know, to put their music in front of me. And I think there, you know, it's not really spoken about because I think it's quite a hard difficult thing to articulate but um i have found over the years that women are not as willing to put themselves forward they're more judgmental of of where they're up to and whether or not they're worthy and all these things you know whether or not they've had kids and they're a bit further behind um it really does feed in a very real way into what ends up on the stage i think and i always remember this great um kind of example that Brené Brown gave in one of her podcasts that I was listening to. And she said one year she was doing a class at a university, running a class, and she told all the students to give themselves at the end their, um, their own mark. So she wasn't going to mark them and they, they were just going to mark themselves. And she said she just couldn't believe it because all of the guys gave themselves almost perfect marks and most of the women gave themselves very critically low marks and I think for me that says a lot about how willing and how critical women are of their own kind of talents and you know productivity and so I think you know this is why also this period of time is so important. Wow that's a real demonstration of imposter syndrome when yeah. <laughs> you think about it. Yeah. So in in uh, organizations both of you work uh, and organize run fantastic um, performance organizations with very different sort of programming do you uh, find that um uh there's a good pool of women to choose from for in leadership and board and management um, positions we're sort of talking more about uh, representation now of women in, in the arts, not just on the stage or um, behind the computer screen, but also um, in management. Julia? Uh, we haven't had any problem mm. finding um, women. In fact, I would say the balance goes the other way with Van Diemen's Band. We have a lot of female, female representation. Um, but uh, I would say that, you know, coming from the same issue, uh, so in in some cases uh, there are performers who would like to go in, into um, learning how to do the more administrative side of um, the work that we do. Um, I mean, this is another thing to talk about, but musicians are not well enough trained uh, in business skills, um, but I would say even less so for women. So I think um, one of the things that we're really interested in doing is providing mentorship roles um, for particularly um, musicians. Uh, I like to focus on musicians to work um, in those roles so that they, A, develop the skills, but also they have that basic understanding, well, more than basic understanding mm. of what we're doing. And um, so, yeah, but, but I, I have to say there's a lot of really willing and talented um, women out there to do that job mm. already. So, yeah, it's great. Claire, how about you? Um, I mean, we, yeah, we're also really pretty good at the whole gender equity thing within our musician cohort, um, our programming, our board. But I have been working quite closely over the last few years with another composer here in Sydney called Felicity Wilcox, who mm -hmm. she comes more from like a film music background originally. And she did some really uh, interesting work recently uh, analysing, for example, the makeup of the boards of the uh, symphony orchestras in Australia, mm -hmm. for example. And you would be very surprised to see the ratios of, you know, that they're not equal. There's many more men on these boards. And, of course, that comes from 
the, the business kind of institutions that this concept of arts organisations having boards, it comes from that business world, right? So, mm. of course, it makes sense that that would be how it is in the first instance. But I think if, you, if you're fighting for change, it has to come from the top down. Like, you know, the little plebs and, and the small groups like mine, we can do only so much. And it needs to be the large organisations and, you know, of course, the Australia Council for the Arts is really stepping up now with the new national cultural policy also. But um, we need to put the pressure on the orchestras to make sure that their power structures are equal because that's the only way that then it's going to feed down into things like programming and people and, and what, what we see in an outward-facing kind of situation. A hmm. um, couple of days ago, when we were when we were talking in advance of this conversation, we talked about um, uh, things, how things have changed since the pandemic. And during the pandemic, um, organisations tried valiantly to continue um, performing and recording, and uh, also. Um, uh, making online content. Certainly the TSO was one of the quickest starters out of the block with making online content. Um, and it was really quite a comfort to people who couldn't go to concerts, who normally would have loved to to go to concerts. Um, and now that we don't have those restrictions anymore, the landscape seems to have changed quite significantly um, in terms of programming, um, uh, conductors visiting, soloists visiting. Claire, do you want to talk a little bit about how things have changed since 2020 for your organisation and also for you as a, as a uh, performer? Um, yeah, I mean, I think aside from being extremely busy last year, which was kind of totally insane for all us musicians, um, going from nothing to everything yes. um, and then wanting to find um, finding a, ba a balance again after these two massive extremes of, of styles of activity in one's life. Um, I guess for me personally, the pandemic was a great opportunity and I don't know if this is what you're getting at, Maria, but um, to develop some kind of resources and also projects that I'd wanted to do for a long time, but, mm. you know, in a normal life situation, you don't have time. And, and I know I was definitely not unique in this, you know, productivity. Mm. Um, but I, you know, you were part of a project I did called Rhythms of Change, which for mm. me personally was an opportunity just to, in one full swoop sort of commission a whole raft of new solo works um, for percussion because I'd noticed uh, when I reflected like we did with Ensemble Offspring in 2017, I had noticed that much of the repertoire, the, the bulk of my repertoire was by male composers and that's what I'd learnt um, you know, during my years studying and mm. that sort of stays with you. And so I thought, how can I be asking young performers and uh, students in their recitals to be trying to go for gender equity or at least have one piece by a female composer if the music just simply is not you know, in existence in, in the same kind of bulk. And so that was a really satisfying project, I think, um, to create music that wasn't, and as you know, because, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this, but the brief that I gave the composers was that it wasn't just to write a really virtuosic piece for me, but it was to create a piece that students would be able to play Technically, right. it wouldn't be too challenging. Mm. Um, so it's much more accessible for a wider group of uh, performers. Yeah. And so the idea is that eventually, I mean, of course, it's hard to cut through for anyone um, really, like, but trying gradually, I'm trying to get the music out to teachers around Australia, to, you know, schools um, and and hopefully eventually make a bit of a difference to the kind of, I mean, it's a lifetime kind of commitment, I guess. It's not mm. something that just changes in seven years. But for me personally, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And so then what I also did was I created a marimba composition kit because I had found over the years that composers didn't quite understand how to write for marimba very well. And in fact, your piece was for marimba. <laughs> I 
didn't write it for you, Maria, but I did give <laughs> I did give examples in the kit of these pieces that I've been working on with the composers. And yeah. that, again, is a way of making sure that if anyone from around the world comes across this kit, they've got Australian music by female composers kind of in front of them and then hopefully that leads them to go and find the recording and find the music at the Australian Music Centre and hopefully program it. And so I'm always thinking of ways to sort of infiltrate the you know international music scene with Australian music by female composers basically yeah and I think also the the fact that you worked with uh, this is another project we can talk about um, if we had the time the composing women's project program through the Sydney con working with each of those four women um, on their marimba pieces probably also sort of connected you to hey maybe I could do something something along these lines that would be you know also targeting women composers but also for student performers and sort of having a, a whole sort of one-stop shop thing in a, in a single project I think was a really smart smart idea and it was a lot of fun as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Julia, how about you with the pandemic and the ensemble? Obviously performing is a lot more challenging at the time when there were restrictions. Yeah, I I would say that um yes, it was an awful time for the arts and um but it gave a lot of opportunity for reflection and mm. also um we had to be nimble and we had to be inventive mm. and um I would say that the the other thing that was really important in in the background or you know parallel was the two movements the me too movement mm. and the black lives matter movement and then all the d- discussions that came from those things and the um the the change in focus i would say about um particularly women's um matters of health mm. um mental health physical health um a lot of those things suddenly became uh, much more important or talked about, shall we say. Mm. They, they've always been important. They just haven't been talked about. That's right. Um, so there are a whole lot of things I think now which are amplifying the female experience and what it is to be a woman um, and talking about those things because we need to talk about them for us to be healthy. Um, and uh, art is one of the great ways of telling those stories. Um, so I think out of the other end of the pandemic, I, I feel that we're on a really positive trajectory in all of that. Also in physical health, you know, we're talking more about menopause. We're talking more about miscarriage. We're talking about the things that are such a central part of women's lives, mm. but in the past had been brushed under the carpet because they were uncomfortable. Mm. Can I just say something, Julia, just something you said then reminded me of um Oh, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. And Maria, you asked me um, before, oh, what did the audiences think of the all-female program? And mm. funnily enough, I remember it was probably more press than audiences, but I think it was also audiences at the time. And you might get this as well, and Julia, you might as well with your programming in the concert tomorrow. But everyone kept saying, like, what so what does music by female composers sound like like how is it different like is it nicer and is it and can you just articulate for us like how how does it sound and I was like I can't do that like it's just music it's just really bloody good music and that's all that matters and it doesn't matter how it's different yes okay it might some pieces might be reflecting the you know life experience of being a woman whatever if that's what the composer decides, but like actually it's got nothing to do with it, how it sounds, <laughs> you know. That's so funny. I, when I was a student, um, I had a, a woman teacher for a couple of years and she said, if you're going to be a successful composer, you need to write music like a man. Mm. And I didn't really know what that meant and I was a bit scared of her anyway, so I just didn't, <laughs> <laughs> didn't ask. And I don't know if I've succeeded, but who knows. <laughs> One thing, again, on that sort of um, self-promotion thing, we, we're featuring a new work tomorrow in our program by Biddy Connor, um, who is a very quietly spoken mm. person and her, you know, the music actually in this case is also uh, she is she's writing about her own experience with breast cancer um, and it's a deeply um, uh, internal 
work, which mm. is something that I find so interesting. I mean, even rhetorically, the music is almost goes in a different direction from the way you would expect it. And I, I feel that that is something that is quite feminine, um, yeah. a, you know, a female way of describing something. Mm. So I would say that is, you know, maybe an element that I can, I can imagine to be a, a, a female way of describing their story. Yes, absolutely. Um, just like to to, uh, to draw our discussion towards the mentoring question. Um, Claire, what kind of mentoring have you been involved with, um, with, with Offspring particularly? Well, I mean, we have... Uh, program called the Hatched Academy, which mm -hmm. is kind of our program for working with composers and I also love the title. <laughs> well we it was one of the first in the country, so it's turning ten uh this year. And so we're very proud that we've sort of grown it over that time and, and it includes a kind of something we call the Hatch Composer Intensive where five composers from around Australia are mentored by, you know, people of the likes of Brett Dean, but other Australian composers. Um, and then we all come together for a week and we perform and document their 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 pieces, their new pieces. So mm -hmm. it's not rocket science, of course, what we're yeah. doing, but I guess what I wanted to say is that as a performer who specialises in new music and commissions a lot, it's kind of like my my whole life is mentoring in a different on different levels, you know. Yeah. I mean, some composers like yourself, you don't need mentoring per se, but the feedback loop is super important for yeah. the final product. And I don't think um, I don't think audiences are probably realise the role that performers play in getting a work to you know to the stage in many mm. instances and so I find that my role uh in doing that process while it can be quite frustrating and it's hard work and it's very fiddly work because you're kind of marking up scores and you're sending photos and you're trying to explain what why something doesn't work and does especially if the composer's not in the same city as you um it's also very worthwhile because hopefully it feels like you're kind of helping that composer understand better how to write for your instrument or, or combination of instruments. And I guess the, you know, on a my more minute level uh, with emerging composers and through the Hatched Academy, um, what we were talking about before about females not necessarily putting themselves, uh, you know, on the line uh, as much, we do have a kind of 50 50 quota for the people who we let through with that program and i mm -hmm. think um that's really important just to make sure that the representation is there um and as you know i've worked super closely with many many young female identifying composers and many of those are relationships that are ongoing and yeah. you know that's also very satisfying from from a performer's perspective because you get to grow almost with that composer. But I just want to say one thing which is maybe not that much to do with female or male or whatever, but it's this expectation that the universe and the, the audiences and the world seems to have that every new work is going to be a masterpiece yeah. because <laughs> that is not generally the case. Oh, yes, and I know. And <laughs> I think we have to, we have to get really really down with just accepting that if it's just a really bloody good piece of music, then that's enough. You know, we should be proud and we have to be proud and we have to support our Australian composers and we have to, you know, really put them on a pedestal. And it, it, the masterpieces that, that we hear now or that Julia's group plays from many years ago, they've often, you know, they've stood the test of time and this music, it's not as the performer who plays, uh, who who uh, commissions and performs this music, you know, I can say from the front line that it's not all going to stand the test of time, but for me, it's about the process. So it's about yeah. that piece then leads into the next one, which will be different because of the process of going through 
the piece before that. So I think it's really important to remember that as well. And, you know, it's like working with First Nations composers as well. It's a new journey. And for many emerging composers, the same thing, you know, they're young, they're trying things out and they need to have that opportunity and that platform to try things out. Otherwise, they're never going to find their voice. Absolutely. Julia? It's such a deeply personal thing, mm. composing as well. I'm not a composer, but when I see a new work on the on the stand, I my first, um, my departure point is saying, this is a story that somebody wants to tell us. Mm. You know, this is something that they're communicating through us. As you say, Claire, we're, they're, we're the sort of what are we conduit. Like the tool. Look, conduit. Yeah, the conduit, exactly um but where our responsibility is to to absolutely give that message across that to mm. the best ability we have and um and i give it the utmost respect because it is mm. it's something that's come from somewhere so mm-hmm. deeply personal and yeah. so important to to that composer so i yeah i i don't I, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to discriminate and to also to expect whatever a masterpiece is, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> totally. What you're into, doesn't it, really? I think it's also really fantastic for composers to uh, have the opportunity to, to work with ensembles that specialise in different areas. So for your ensemble, playing new music on old instruments is a really exciting and, and fascinating opportunity uh, as as well for Claire um, using sort of auxiliary instruments as well as a lot of percussion, I think is, is a really um, a unique opportunity for composers to learn to work with those instruments. And then should they need to use them in a larger piece, like a larger chamber ensemble piece or a orchestra piece, then they've sort of, you know, had that opportunity to see how little subsets of the of the orchestral palette can actually work. And what's your piece. experience, Maria, with um, mentoring through the, the TSO or composing I've done women? A, yeah, or- I've done a lot of mentoring through the TSO because they've always had fantastic um, elite training programs. Uh, at the moment, they're working with the um, Australian Conducting Academy, but they all have always uh, worked with the um, Composers School, which I helped sort of um, renew in in around 2006, 2007. And that's just been, has basically become one of the country's leading um um, mentorship programs for composers, but also through the through that um, project with the TSO, I've also been able to work with Year Eleven and Twelve students around Tasmania who've been able to be mentored by myself, but also by TSO players. And um, I've been involved in the Composing Women's program through the Sydney Con. So it's been a it's been a really fantastic opportunity, um, not just because I'm a woman composer, but because I'm a composer as well. Yeah. Hey, yeah. and just one thing, I, n- I note that many of the composers who I work with um, – often say, oh, there aren't many opportunities to learn how to write for orchestra Mm. and likewise opera. Um, And I know that you, and it's probably because you have been based in Hobart and you've had this amazing connection with the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra, Mm. you've written a lot of music for orchestra. But um, I do think that's one place where Australia can step up and is hopefully stepping up right now. And, you know, mm. you've got the Cybeck Composers Program in with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and then what you just um, described in Tassie. But I think, you know, composers do find it very difficult and very challenging to write for such big cohorts. And I know that speaking to some of mm. my composing women friends, the, the first time that they went down and they had their drafts sort of played by the TSO was very confronting and, and yeah. challenging time. Yes, yeah. So the, the Youth Orchestra Network could really also, um, I, I know the Sydney Youth Orchestra are doing a lot more commissioning now, for example, mm-hmm. and I think that yeah. that, that should, um, you know, funnel through to the symphony orchestras as well. I mean, mm-hmm. I personally think that, and we're going to aim for this um, for in the next year or two, I, I personally think that there should always be a new commission on every program. Mm, that would be Actually, great. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. to make every program relevant to the world we live in now. Mm, fantastic. But then there's also the argument of um, who I know that uh, Shane Simpson, who is on the board of the Sydney Youth Orchestra, he makes the argument back to me all the time because, of course, uh, at least 50% of our programs are world premieres 
usually, and we 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 premiere about fifteen p- new works a year, which is very high mm. content. Um, but he makes the argument, which I do think is good to remember as well, that you don't just want to create this kind of um, culture of the premiere, which mm. if it's not a masterpiece, <laughs> just goes into the cupboard, never yep. to be heard again. Um, I think it is really important to, especially Australian music of the last 50 to 100 years, to go back and, and put those pieces in front of audiences again and make sure that there's that consciousness about around repeat performances mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, we get so obsessed with the new, the latest, what's the world premiere, what, what's the new sound going to be, and then we forget that a really amazing piece was composed five or ten years ago and it only got played once or twice. And mm. with my concerto commissioning, for example, I always, because it's so hard and so expensive to get a new work with an orchestra up, I, I push very hard to try and get the orchestras to, to program them because... I'm not, I'm not in the business of just creating a piece and then saying, okay, well, we did that performance and goodbye, that's the end of that piece, you know. Like you want to get it out there and I think it's really important. Absolutely, and I do think that orchestras around Australia do need to step up, And I, but I'm also very aware that regional orchestras and, and uh, more community-based orchestras are often really keen to play orchestral music by emerging composers. I had another another teacher who always said to me, um, different teacher, <laughs> that um, uh, it's not the first performance that's that's hard to get, it's the second performance, so yeah. exactly what you're, you're <laughs> saying as well. Yeah. Um, I think we're really nearly running out of time. Do we have any questions? from the audience. I think that's the way to go. We put yeah. a few lollies in there and yeah, yeah. <laughs> then challenge the audience. Bring I think out be, the composer for a conversation. Yeah, I, build I the think. trust in the audience. Absolutely. Build, yeah. build the trust in your ensemble. I think there's also, there's nothing worse that, than being ghettoised as well. Like, oh, well, let's just keep all the women's music in this concert and let's have all our audience go to that one. Then there'll be only 25 people in the, in the concert with women's um, music. I think that's the wrong approach. So... Yeah. Claire, do you have anything to say? Oh, well, I was just going to say that we, we don't really have any lollies at all no. <laughs> in our programming. <laughs> <laughs> so if you run a music ensemble that specialises in or only plays music by living composers, um, it's a pretty tough marketing sell mm-hmm. because there is a a real fact around the fear of the unknown for everything. Mm. Music, art is different and I think I've worked out it's because you can walk away or also art being fresh and new is much more expected. I don't know. But for music, it's really hard and we do it through, like Julia said, like trust in the ensemble, that that thing of kind of, you know, an audience to ensemble offspring almost expects the unexpected, but they also expect that it will always be of a certain quality. It will be engaging. There will be um, composers there. It will be kind of fresh and living and reflecting our lived experience of life in Australia right now. And I think that's really important, but it's it's difficult because that's not the tradition of how the orchestras have marketed over many centuries, for example. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. I would say that most music would qualify. I personally feel that um, music is about elevating the spirit generally, um, whether that's in in a very precise way or in a much more obtuse way. Uh, 
Yeah, mm. I I, th- I also think that uh, in the day of uh, the day of social media, there are a lot more opportunities to find musicians or ensembles or even arts organisations that um, focus on on spirituality in in music. So I think that it's a question of just hunting around. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm not sure. I I think the TSO does very well in terms of Australian music and they have a tremendous commitment to Australian music. Um, I think there's always more to be done for all Australian orchestras, uh, as Claire was saying before. Julie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, certainly in the contemporary, um, well, I would say that they had a big commissioning program um, and still do. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm not, f- I don't work for the TSO, so I'm not probably mm. qualified to say what they're doing and what they're planning. Um, but yeah, I think generally, as we said before, all of the symphony orchestras could be, you know, they're the ones that have the most funding. And so they are in a position where they could be helping um, at, from the ground up with um, promoting, particularly if we're talking about today's talk, um, women composers women artists, women conductors. Yes, well, I, I know that the TSO has a endowment for uh, working with women conductors in particular, and they've always been extremely supportive of uh, women composers when they receive um, pieces that they like to program. And also um, the TSO has been the one to put its hand up to uh, work with the orchestral pieces by the um composing women's program through the Sydney Conservatorium. So uh, a couple of years ago, a number of the composers were um, uh, brought down from Sydney and they worked with uh, the orchestra and a conductor and I was involved with mentoring them as well. And then the next uh, batch of composers was working with Lisa Lim and they also came down and had their music uh, recorded and workshopped by the the TSO. And I think that the, the TSO has a real commitment to it, to Australian music, but also uh, women composers in a mentoring role, particularly. And can I just say as well that that many of those pieces are being performed tonight at the Sydney Conservatorium by the Sydney Symphony Fellows, actually, and as a kind of official wrap-up of the Composing Women program, which has been disbanded. Yep. Right. Fantastic. That's yeah. two big concerts in one weekend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we have uh, run out of time. Um, Great. So, Amalia. <laughs> thank you, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me back on. And thank you so much, Claire, Maria and Julia, for a wonderful conversation.